Unlike other years, I feel pretty nervous. I don't know why. Probably because this is the very great venue, or this is the city I watch over, uh, over and over in the, in the Hollywood movies. <laughs> uh, and then, well, when I speak in English, I feel like I'm 30% 30, 30 less intelli intelligent. <laughs> But, uh, okay, you have to stand because you don't speak Japanese, right? Well, in the year 1993, I started developing Ruby. I was, I was 27. And then I made it just for fun. I have no ambition <laughs> to take over the world or anything, <laughs> or I didn't try to make any money out of it. I just created programming language for fun. Just because when I, soon after I started programming when I was 15, uh, I was interested in programming languages because, you know, back then, uh, you know, our programming language is called BASIC which is pretty much basic. <laughs> and then, it, the, you know, these days, basic are pretty, you know, evolved. But, uh, you know, in early 80s, the basic programming language was pretty, uh, you know, limited. And then, I didn't know any other programming language, so I didn't know the reason, but I feel, I felt so, frustrated because of the limitation of the language. And then I find a book explaining the programming language named Pascal, which is yeah, also the ancient programming language. <laughs> and then I didn't have a computer to execute the Pascal compiler because back then those PCs uh, come, came with the basic interpreter so that we have to buy operating system and compiler to execute the, the Pascal compiler or C compiler. And uh, the C compiler, oh, these compilers uh, costed, I don't know, $2,000 US dollars or something. So that it is too expensive for high school students. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just read through the book. And I learned many things, like uh, the structured programming and the user-defined data structure. Uh, the in, in Pascal, it's, it's called re record. And then user-defined function. Those ideas are pretty much enlightened for me. And then, then I, you know, back then, I pretty much interested in uh, programming computers and uh, programming languages, and that's along with kind of psychology. So that I interested in how human mind can be expressed, and then so the programming language is you know is the form of expressing our ideas, right? Then so I. That's, I think that, that was the reason I got interested in programming languages. So that I read research about uh, the local bookstore or libraries, and then I graduated from high school and went, I went to the university, majored in computer science, and then, gosh, so the, the university library has tons of books and papers about programming languages. So I studied about programming languages. And uh, I found out these programming language are uh, designed by intention. So that we didn't know who invented English, right? And then no Japanese, no Chinese, or any other natural language. But uh, every programming language has its inventor or designer. And uh, these languages are designed by intention. So that, for example, the Pascal was designed to be an 
educational programming language. And the C programming language is a language to replace assembly to uh, implement operating system, Unix. So that those programming languages are designed by clear intention by human beings. So that my, it was my teenage dream, it was my teenage dream, but uh, so these programming languages are designed by people, so why not me? <laughs> yeah, it was kind of t my teenage dream, but uh, you know, remember, it, it, was, it was 80s, we didn't have internet. <laughs> So that there's no way to you know, Google to, about the implementation of the compiler or anything. So that, uh, I took the book from my local bookstore. I, I live near, uh, next to the bookstore. So that I went to the bookstore and then they took the, the book titled The Compiler and I read. But uh, it was the textbook for you know, the university class. And it was too difficult for high school students. So I screwed up. <laughs> so I entered the university, majoring in computer science. I learned a lot about the computer science and graduated from the school. Then I worked as a professional programmer for several years. And, and then finally, I thought I got, talent, task, got enough skill to implement my own programming language. And uh, it was uh, 93. Back then, total number of my, my programming language was <laughs> one. <laughs> because, you know, I didn't publish. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I developed by along the that programming language for two, more than two years. And then I felt, okay, this my used to be toy programming language got to be realistic and usable. And then, okay, I, it's about the time to put it in on the internet. Oops. So I put it in, in the internet. So then soon after that, uh, I formed the, the mailing list. Do you know what it is? <laughs> <laughs> we used to be use mails <laughs> to communicate in, in, uh, among, the, uh, among the community because we didn't, we didn't have the yeah, World Wide Web. Yeah, actually, the World Wide Web was invented in 90, uh, 1990, so there was an internet, but uh, it, is, it is not for the, you know, the general public. So that I didn't use the internet, so I formed a mailing list. And then soon after I formed the mailing list, 200 people joined that mailing list. So that, you know, the, the community was formed by number of 200. And then, uh, by this community, many people uh, try to ask me, uh, report, bu bu report bugs, and uh, uh, give, gave me suggestions and anything. You know, the, the open source community movement has started. Actually, we didn't call it, uh, we called it open source because it's 95. The, <laughs> the term open source was invented in 97, okay, uh, 98, I mean, 98. So it was older than that. So we called them free software, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> then, year 2000, the, remember the Y2K things? <laughs> so the, December 31st, 1999, I got an email from the publisher, uh, the Alison Wesley, 
And then they wanted to publish a book uh, about my, my programming language, Ruby. And then, okay, I said, okay, because and I, I wrote a book in Japanese, but it's quite difficult for me to write them or translate, translate it into English. So that if someone, talented someone, uh, wrote book for me, for my programming language, it is more than, uh, more than welcome. So that I agreed on the, that day, on the December 31st, 1999. And then for that fortune, so we didn't have any big accident in that day. So that in, in year 2000, the, the, the book named the Peacock's Books was published. So the, the, the team of two called the Programmatic Programmers, they wrote the book very extensively. So it took them eight months to write the whole book of, I don't remember, 400 pages? And it's big, big books. And then the, the front page is the, like this, and then we have pickaxe on the front page, so we call it the pickaxe book. So the first book was published, and they, they sold the 20,000 copies of the first version of the pickaxe book. 20,000, it's, it's quite a number, not, not that big. Uh, consider that, the, back then, Ruby is, you know, virtually no one knows Ruby <laughs> back then. So the, you know, 20,000 copy is quite a number. And then I estimated that the, the Ruby users back then is a 10,000 or something. You know, not everyone bought book used the Ruby, I, I guess. I guess. <laughs> year 2001, next year. We have the, the first RubyConf, this conference. The first one was held in Tampa, Florida. And uh, the day, uh, a few days before the, the Uppsala conference in, of, of the ACM. The attendees was, okay, we have so many atten RubyConf attendees here, probably 800. And uh, we had, in first Ruby conference, we had 34 attendees. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this year, we had a Ruby Kaigi conference in Sendai, in Japan, and we had a thousand attendees there. And then uh, this conference, Ruby Conf India, they just registered attendees are 800. So the, and then uh, some people estimated the current Ruby number of Ruby users is over one million. Uh, actually, in Ruby is open source. There's no way to count the actual number of users. But uh, you know, the, from the, the traffic of internet and, the, and the, the sales of the books or something. So the, and some people estimated the number. Okay, one to one million. That's the number. <laughs> Ruby became popular. Ruby is used everywhere. Numerous applications are written in Ruby, from small to big, especially in web field. Uh, small startups use Ruby. Uh, big companies like Twitter, Netflix, Airbnb use uh, Ruby. And the DevOps use Ruby like a, by use, through the Chef and Puppet or other things. And then embedded program people started adopting Ruby by the, the autonomy implementation in MRuby. The, the Ruby is used in robots, payment devices, and the microsatellites, and et cetera. And uh, some web servers embed Ruby, like uh, Nginx and H2O. Uh, the Ruby also used in embedded in games. Like, uh, for example, Nia Automata or some other games. And then and then you use Ruby, right? <laughs> <laughs> For some reason. <laughs> uh, the, we call those people community. It said the open source software relies heavily on community. By the way, what is the community? A group of people, like a city of Los Angeles, or state of California, 
for United States of America. They are real communities. But the uh, OSDS community is not really like that. They are not a mere group of people. Uh, nature of open source community is less known. So that I use Ruby, you use Ruby, some individuals use Ruby. And unlike real communities, we have no registration of the Ruby community. So you have any initiation to enter into the Ruby community? No, we have no vote, we have no mayor. <laughs> so that, that open source community is kind of virtual existence. We can't touch it. And uh, op so open source community, uh, you are communi the community. And at the same time, you are not really the community because, you know, the open source community is not exclusive. Anyone use JavaScript here? Everyone use JavaScript here. <laughs> <laughs> so that you are part of the JavaScript community, right? It's okay. It's not exclusive. <laughs> 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 we don't have membership. We are not exclusive. So that the open source software community is kind of vague structure of developers and others. So the, I feel it's kind of like a typhoon. <laughs> you know, when typhoon came, we see rains, we see wind, and we see low, low pressure. These are observable. And, uh, and uh, we can understand the, the movement of atmosphere molecules. But uh, we don't touch typhoon. Okay, we, okay, the TV says, okay, typhoon is coming. So the, beware of typhoon, be a wind or something like that. It's, the typhoon itself is kind of vague structure of wind and rains and the clouds and something like that. And then we cannot touch, nor move, nor even delete the, the typhoon. But uh, this vague structure, at the same time, comes with very huge power. Okay, the Ruby community is kind of like that. We see you, 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 so that you are part of the Ruby community, but that you cannot be uh, representative of the Ruby community. Okay, you are part of the Ruby community. Uh, I often considered as a leader of the Ruby community, but actually I'm not. <laughs> I'm just a part of Ruby community. Uh, but uh, Ruby is heavily rely on the community. So we got many bug reports from community. I remember, I, I told you about the, the forming of the mailing list in, back in 95. And then the first, uh, first mail in the mailing list was from my friend. Okay, congratulations about the forming of the mailing list. <laughs> Good friend. Okay, the second mail is, by the way, I cannot compile your, your Ruby program on you know, my com <laughs> <laughs> the compiler. <laughs> The third medicine was from me. Okay, I fixed it, thank you. <laughs> and the fourth, fourth mail was, okay, I find another bug. <laughs> <laughs> then I fixed it, report, <laughs> fix it. That keep, keep going. Okay, we, we got tons of bug reports in the history of Ruby. So that actually, I don't consider myself as a, say, genius programmer, but uh, you know, I, I think I am very good at designing language, but I don't consider myself as a great programmer. So I created so many bugs. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the, in the past, we got so many uh, feature requests and the proposal in the history. So the uh, first Unicode support was uh, introduced by the, from, uh, the proposal from the community 
the, the feature like an enumerator or, of, or other things as a, a contribution from the community. Generational garbage collector, keyword arguments, and then the discussion about the future types, and the JIT compiler, and the concurrency support, they, these are from the community. It's not from me. So I, you know, I got proposals. I considered a lot, and I investigated them a lot, a lot and I made a final decision. But still, I was not the one who invented or the, who came up, who come up with those ideas. And then I'm not very good at not document writer, so the, the community, the many people contributed about the, the making Ruby documents and tutorials better. And then they formed the meetups, they wrote books, they organized the conferences, they in, in implemented the frameworks and the gems. So that we owe much to the community. So what drives the, the open source community? Uh, the biggest one, I think, is the intellectual curiosity. So that we like, say, puzzles, and then like Sudoku or something like that. So that the designing or fixing or improving the language is kind of similar things. So open source, uh, open source activities often are driven by intellectual curiosity. Or maybe some, some want recognition about contribution to the community. Or maybe some people like communications. Like, a, you know, the communication be, uh, to, between the, you know, similar personality is kind of fun, uh, amusing. Like a Ruby friend things, so the make friend is pretty much fun. Have a conversation with a, a stranger with similar uh, interest is quite amusing, quite interesting. And then some people work for money. Yeah, that's important. And uh, some people work for responsibility. So the open source community does not have uniform mindset. We are all different, but that's okay. We, as I said, community is like Typhoon, so that this molecule and this molecule has a different movement, but still forms a Typhoon and a very big power. The community is kind of like that. So the Ruby was used to be a one person project and the 200 million list members, and the 20,000 copies of the first English book, and the conference all over the world. So the community has grown. Ruby increased its power. So the, and then I believe Ruby has the best open source community, right? Because of being friendly and being nice. I am proud of this community. Uh, the Ruby, the language is, just a thought. I created the language, and I put it into, on the internet. The community was formed. So the Ruby, the community, is the value. So the, how can we maximize the, that value? Providing benefit, productivity, and the comfortable community, the scalability, and the intellectual challenge. So that we need to feed community Otherwise, community members will go away. So that if you're bored about the Ruby language, so you can go anywhere, like a Rust, Go, Python, whatever. So that there are tons of other, you know, attractive programming languages out there. So that you are free to go out. So that, but uh, we, we, core members, we need to for, uh, feed the community. OS this community is like a shark. This parable use, uh, I used for uh, years, but this year someone pointed out that not every shark needs to swim all the time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, some kind of shark. <laughs> uh, uh, we have to keep swimming. So that we, open source software cannot stop and or it will eventually fade away. One anxiety, I have one anxiety, which is I'm sick of hostile claims, like a Ruby is dead things. Because Ruby gems have less GitHub stars on GitHub, 
because Ruby doesn't have static typing, <laughs> because Ruby is no longer shiny language, does this mean Ruby is fading? Despite of our effort to make Ruby better? I disagree, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's something named this hype cycle. The new technology comes and goes, but uh, its popularity from the, this kind of graph. Like uh, the started, then the popularity goes up, but uh, goes too high, the too, too much expectation, or maybe illusion. Then many people notice it's over exaggerated. So the, the, many people disappointed about the new technology. So the, the popularity fall down to the trough of disillusionedness. Then people realize, okay, the, the past boom was illusion, but this technology surely has some value. Then uh, we recognize the technology and the then the technology goes to the plateau of productivity. Uh, probably we are in the trough of this illusion. You know, there a few years ago, the, the Rails best age was the year two, 2009 to 2020 or something. We we are at the peak. So the, we were in the eighth or seventh in the TLB index, popularity, programming language popularity index, and then everyone used Ruby, and then Ruby was pretty hot <laughs> back then. <laughs> but uh, you know, the, some people noticed, you know, there, were, there are some programming languages some, sometimes uh, that runs faster, or, uh, or even handles more traffic in the very heavy uh, traffic websites. So the, we, so the we are in the trough of disillusionment or, or in the plateau of productivity. Uh, if we are in the, at the bottom of the trough, we can only go up. <laughs> so the best time to invest. <laughs> If we're in the proud of productivity, past the, past the trough, the productivity has the best benefit. So this means we are in a golden age. In any way, we are not fading. So the people love bizarre things, and uh, people love new and shiny things. Then new language comes every year, uh, new frameworks comes every year. It's fun. Being fun is pretty much important, I agree. And you know, Ruby is fun programming language. But we are grown-ups. <laughs> no, no new language every year, no new frameworks every year, no longer. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> we must, ah, I, I made a mistake in the slides. We must not be fragile in our choice. <laughs> <laughs> we must not be fragile. Uh, Twitter have moved away from Ruby. So people say uh, Ruby is dead because of that. But Ruby declined popularity ranking. Ruby is not recommended. So what? <laughs> Oops. Uh, Ruby helped the trials and errors. And then, okay, they, Ruby helped to form Twitter. You know, uh, when Twitter started in 2007, I guess, so the Twitter was uh, the micro blog, we said, of the 140 characters. That's, that's, that's nothing. That sound, sounds like a stupid idea. <laughs> the, the blog, that every entry is limited to 140 characters. Sounds silly, right? <laughs> so the many, uh, you know, many venture capitalists uh, refused to invest to the Twitter because of that set kind of silliness. But uh, the people in the Twitter the tried, tried and errored the, to form the current Twitters, like adding hashtags, 
There are mentions, uh, re retreat, many things. So that Twitter became uh, some kind of the infrastructure, our messaging infrastructure. And then, so the Ruby helped their trials and errors. And then the Twitter succeeded. Then they formed, uh, I don't know, hundreds of millions of users or maybe billions of users or something. So that uh, the Ruby is now really uh, outperformed this kind of traffic. Remember, these days, Twitter used Ruby 1.8. So it's quite tough. So that, that kind of uh, trials and error itself is the barrier. So the, remember, Twitter used 1.8. So the, uh, we implemented the new virtual machine after that. So the break even point has even moved far away. So that now Ruby is much faster, and now Ruby is more scalable, and then now Ruby is feature rich. So that what we need more? Maybe we need developers, business success stories, sponsors, conferences, development grants, job board, the communication, community, and uh, yeah, and we have those things, and we need more. The Ruby's policy, one of Ruby's policy is never give up. So the back in 90s, when Ruby was baby, yeah, many people claimed me about Perl is enough, we don't need no new, new scripting language. And I said no. <laughs> And then a, a person sent me an email. The ob object-oriented programming is now really uh, required for scripting. So Ruby is scripting language, so the ob object-oriented programming is just too much. And uh, I said no. <laughs> and then some people claim the smaller programming language, the simpler, the smaller in spec or syntax is better. And then relatively, Ruby is more complex. You know? Ruby is not sure, but not simple. So that I said, no. <laughs> so some people claim that Ruby is slow. And then it was slow back in, say, 1.8. So then, but we, we've, been, we've improved them a lot. So that I said, no. <laughs> so the, some, some people said we should add type annotation to the language, like a Python 3 did and a PHP 7 did. So then I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so then I never give up. <laughs> we, we had other programming languages back in the 90s. We had tons of uh, programming languages developed by the individuals. So now, these days, new programming language uh, developed by the organization or company, like a Go from Google, or uh, Swift from Apple, and other programming language from the, the companies and the individuals. But in uh, the 90s, so the, most of the programming languages are from individuals. And then we had uh, many, many programming languages out there in the 90s. But uh, very few survives. Then, if everyone else went away, they gave up. So the, the best way for survival is we, the policy to the community and uh, not giving up and keep moving. So the, we've, been done, we've done great things as a community. So that we use Ruby, we earn money, <laughs> we hire developers, and uh, participation to the community, like a uh, conference, be nice and be happy and uh, contribute to our effort and uh, form positive uh, feedback loops, improve the productivity, lower learning curves, and we provided the great tools and libraries like Ruby on Rails and Ruby Gems, for example. And we had a great Ruby community but uh, what can we do more to survive, to keep, keep being great? So the, I propose we uh, lengthen our stride one step further, out of comfort zone. 
attend one more conference, make a new friend, uh, try new things. So that, okay, look into your next person and uh, look into eyes, <laughs> shake hands. <laughs> how great you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, then uh, during the conference and after you came back home, admire others, share your idea, share your feeling to blogs, Twitter, Facebook, or Medium, or whatever. So that this kind of things will be a drop of water, but uh, it, it will form the ocean. You do your part, we do our part. We will try our best to survive. So we will improve the language. For example, we are working on Ruby 3, everything for productivity. Uh, we will improve the performance, we will improve the concurrency, we will improve the code, code analysis and tools. So if you do your part, one step further, it will change the world to the better place for the better future. Not the end. <laughs> so our future, our future is uncertain, but uh, we are trying to make uh, Ruby 2.6 in this year, Christmas. It comes with the endless ranges, the kernel then, and number 2H, Jet compiler, experimental, the plug call, faster plug call, and the faster heap implementation. So the, I, I found a good summary of Ruby 2.6 here. So the guy Malia is here or not, but uh, thanks to him. So now, okay, tiny URL, Ruby 2.6. And then we are going to have the Ruby three on Ruby 2020, hopefully. <laughs> and then we are working, uh, in addition, we are working on the pattern matching and same keyword arguments, a better tooling, and a better concurrency in Ruby 3. Yeah, that, this is the future to 2020. So even, I'm going to tell a little bit about the even further future. Uh, Guido van Rossen, which invented a Python, was retired this year. I was, I was kind of shocked. You know, he was nine years older than me, and he invented Python years before Ruby. But then, I will turn 60 in 2025. <laughs> so time think about retirement. <laughs> so the, after my retirement, Ruby is designed by committee, and uh, I said definitely no. <laughs> so the uh, form language design app, artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it's possible. But, uh, but uh, I'm vaguely thinking about uh, the Ruby 4 project in 2025. So that I have no concrete idea yet, but uh, it is kind of the practice for the future so that, you know, the, the world without me. So that it's, it should be the test bed for the new design process. So the future is un uncertain, but uh, after releasing Ruby 2.3, we, we will work, experiment something for the future named the Ruby 4. So the future is uncertain, we have to be prepared. We will keep moving forward at least. We will lengthen our stride. We have to lengthen stride to make something good. So that we will create value as a community. So that when I say we, 
that includes you. Thank you.